Okay, so welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for the wonderful World of Lichens, a training event by Saving Devon's Treescapes of Devon Wildlife Trust tonight. I'm Lindsay Marn, I'm the Citizen Science Assistant for the project and delighted that we're joined tonight by our expert speaker, April Windle. Would you like to say hello, April? Hi, everybody. So we're going to take about an hour tonight, which would include about 10 minutes or so at the end for questions, depending on how things go. Um, and I'm just going to do a very short introduction to the project to start with. I can get my screen to move on. So Saving Devon's Treescapes project started in 2020. So we're now in the second year of delivery for the project. The reason it exists as a partnership project led by Devon Wildlife Trust on behalf of a large number of partners across the county is as a response to ash dieback disease, which you're probably all aware of. So ash dieback is expected to affect 90% or so of our trees across the whole of the UK. Um, and we will lose those ash trees from our treescapes. So the aim of our project over five years that we will uh, exist for is to support local communities to make our treescapes more resilient by planting a lot of trees. So we are giving away a lot of trees during the course of the project in various different ways that you can find out more about on our Saving Devon's Treescapes webpage if you'd like to take a look. The link is at the bottom of that slide. So our focus is on trees outside of woodland, so we're not a woodland creation project, and we are focusing on five areas in the county, but working countywide. And those five focus areas are in South Devon, Torbay, Exeter and Cranbrook, the Cody Valley area in East Devon, and also Naroche, which just crosses the border into Somerset as well. Now, along with that, we're focusing some citizen science work on some key species, which depend in one way or another on our treescapes and particularly on ash trees. So lichens are one of those key species and we're here tonight obviously to learn about those. But there are also a number of other species. There's a brown hair street butterfly shown there, um, which we're also monitoring. And again, you can find out more about those by having a look at our um, webpage on the Devon Wildlife Trust website. So now I'm gonna hand over to April for the main part of the evening and she can tell us about the wonderful world of lichens. Thank you, Lindsay. That's really great. Um, uh, people are still coming into the waiting room, so they're going to need to be admitted. Um, I'll just share my screen for everybody. OK, there we go. So hopefully everybody can see my screen and thank you for that introduction, Lindsay, to the project and to myself. Hello, everybody. Um, before I start, I just want to say a huge thank you for taking the time to come along this evening. The fact that we've got over 100 people signed on to this presentation is so excellent and I'm really delighted there are so many of you that are interested to learn more about lichens. I also want to say a really big thank you to the, the Saving Devon Treescapes Project and the Wildlife Trust for putting on such opportunities for people to learn more about lichens. I always really enjoy giving talks like this. So my name is April Windle. I'm a naturalist based in Devon, where my entire life is revolved around lichens in various capacities. I'm self-employed and I'm involved in various lichen surveys, conservation projects and education works as well. And this is mainly in the southwest, but also across the entirety of the British Isles. In addition to this, I also chair the Education and Promotions Committee of the British Lichen Society, where as a collective, well, as a society, we aim to promote the, the study, conservation and enjoyment of lichens within Great Britain and across Ireland. I'm super delighted to be involved with the, the Devon Treescapes project, and I am so pleased that there is such a strong focus on lichens within the project. So thank you for that, Lindsay. Um, I'm also involved with the project uh, through delivering a range of events, and this is mainly focused over the next few months. But I also contribute to the lichen element of the, the research and monitoring working group. 
So over the course of this presentation, I'm going to be covering three key areas, which includes an introduction to lichens, especially in relation to ash and ash dieback, where I'll provide a, a little bit of a potted tour around some of the key ash sites in Devon. I'll then also provide a very short and very brief introduction into how we go about identifying lichens and the joys, all of the joys that that brings. Um, but we'll be going through some of the key characters that we use to go through those early stages of identification. Then the, the final part of the presentation, the final part of the talk, we'll go through the project's target species, which includes a mixture of common and also some of the rarer species that are found to occupy ash. So let's make a start. Lichens. Lichens, lichens, lichens. <laughs> they are absolutely amazing. They add so much colour and texture and integrity to the world around us. And to me, they are a real thing of beauty. And they're such quirky and interesting life forms to study. And they just tell you so much about the environment in which they're found, especially in relation to environmental quality. Within Great Britain and Ireland, we have over 2000 species of lichen and they are really characteristic of any habitat that you explore. So from the summits of Scotland, uh, sorry, the summits of the mountains up in Scotland uh, to the rocky shores of the coast, lichens can be found absolutely everywhere. The reason that I love lichens is they just make you slow down a little bit in space and time and they really make you appreciate the small things like this gate, for example, um, who would have ever thought it would take nearly an hour to walk from one side of the gate to the other side of the gate, but it, it certainly did. And I mean, it's really understandable when you've got a surface that looks like this. This gate was absolutely festooned in lichens and it just supports a plethora of life. So what is a lichen? I hear you scream. <laughs> very, very complicated question to ask and uh, not always the easiest to answer. But despite their very plant-like appearance, a lichen is actually a fungus. So lichens sit within the biological kingdom fungi. In fact, as a fungus, lichens are more closely related to humans than they are to plants, which is really hard to believe when you look at a picture like this. But lichens, they, they are a really special type of fungus because what they do is they, they partner up with either an algae or a cyanobacteria, sometimes even both um, of these biomes. And they form this gorgeous partnership where all of these species interact and coexist and form this structure, which we call a lichen. If there is an available surface, you can pretty much guarantee that a lichen is going to grow on it. Lichens inhabit all sorts of substrates from rocks to trees to the gates that I showed um, earlier and every, every other substrate in between. It's really quite remarkable, actually, the places that they can live. But uh, for the, the, the purpose of this presentation and the project, um, we're going to be focusing specifically on, on ash. So ash, uh, Fraxinus excelsior, is, is definitely one of our most beloved native trees that we have here in the UK. As a species, it's completely gorgeous and it's an exceptionally important tree for a range of biodiversity, but particularly for its lichens. So just to put the importance of ash into context within Devon, I have fiddled around with some of the British Lichen Society data, and this is for Vice County 3 and Vice County 4, which covers South and North Devon. And but before I start, I just want to say that Devon is the most recorded county within Great Britain and Ireland, and it has a whopping 125,000 plus uh, lichen records, which covers over 1,400 species of lichens and lichenicolous fungi. So it's a monumental uh, data set and evidence base that we use to inform decisions and to inform management. So with over 1,400 species across the county, uh, lichens contribute quite significantly to biodiversity in Devon. 
Of these, of these records, so the 125,000, uh, nearly 6,000 of these have been recorded on ash, <clears throat> which is comprised of about 348 species of lichen. Some of these species do occur on other trees, but some of them are only recorded on ash. So the loss of ash will be really significant on some lichen populations. Of these 348 species, 118 of these are notable. So what this means, what, what I mean when I say notable is that uh, they are either nationally rare, nationally scarce, or they are of international responsibility. And when I say international responsibility, I mean that the British Isles has 10% or more of the European and or global population of that species. And in some cases, these species are not found anywhere else in the globe, they are endemic. 21 of these, 21 of these species of the, the 348 species, they're, they're categorized as near threatened and 14 of them are classed as threatened. So uh, when we say threatened, these are classified um, as IUCN, critically endangered, endangered or as vulnerable. So pretty important. And I think that just really highlights the importance of ash for its lichens especially with the demise of ash, um, sorry, the demise of ash across the landscape um, as a result of ash dieback. And it just really emphasizes uh, how crucial it is for projects such as the Devon Treescapes project to, to be in operation. So next slide. I just wanted to provide a bit of a potted tour of the county across Devon of a handful of sites that are really important for lichens on ash. These sites are sites that I have worked with quite intimately. I've done lots of survey work there, so you really get, get down to the nitty gritty and get to know them. And the sites that I've included, um, included within this tour are Heartland Vale, Lidford Gorge, Holne Woodlands, well, a site near Holne Woodlands, sorry, and also Thea Park as well. <clears throat> So the first site I want to take you to is Heartland Vale up in North Devon. This is a really spectacular coastal valley which supports an excellent array of post-mature and veteran trees. But unfortunately, ash is really poorly represented as a tree species at this site. However, there is this single ash uh, remaining that hasn't been whacked by ash dieback and it supports a really extensive population of a lichen called Cryptolechia carniolutea. I mean, the whole tree, the whole trunk is sheeted in this species. This is a really scarce, really declining species. Um, it has a real stronghold on ash and it's categorized as endangered by the IUCN. There are, in Devon, from the top of my head, there really are only a handful of sites that this species occurs. The second site I would love to take you to uh, is a site that I was surveying last week is Lidford Gorge. And this is a, a deep wooded chasm that sort of cuts through the northwest corner of Dartmoor. And here ash is a really significant component of the canopy where you have this localized humidity from the, from the gorge and you have the light that sort of hits the, the tops of the trees on the twigs and the branches. And it's resulted in really impressive Liberian communities, so base rich bark communities, and uh, a very strong colony of this species, which is called Peltigera colina. And this is a scarce and declining species in Devon. I mean, you could probably count on one or two hands the number of sites that it occurs. And the only tree species in the entirety of the gorge that this species is found on. Um, so this Peltigera species is found on is ash, unfortunately. So ash dieback has the potential to have really devastating impacts on the lichens at this site. The third site I, I want to take you to on my tour, and this site sits very, very closely to my heart. Um, it's a, a, wood, it's a, a, a road actually uh, near Holm Woodlands. And there is this really spectacular ash avenue um, along the small road that supports a super large population of Liberia pulmonaria. And this is also known as the lungwort lichen. And this 
site here is one of the few sites in England that was actually designated as a triple SI, so a site of special scientific interest, solely based on its lichen feature and nothing else. And it's because of this lovely population of lungwort lichen. Unfortunately, uh, this species of Liberia and all species of Liberia, we have four in the British Isles, they are declining massively in terms of their distribution and their health across the county. And this site here uh, near Holm Woodlands is one of the, the strongest populations for this species in Devon. But unfortunately, with all of the, the material being on ash, it's also one of the most vulnerable sites that we've got. The fourth and final site I want to take you to on my tour of Devon is this lovely little urban parkland near me. It's called Fear Park in Exmouth. And me and a colleague recently discovered an ash tree here that supports a, a threatened lichen called Parmelina carpa risens. And this is a hugely threatened lichen um, that has a really strong preference, almost obligate on ash. So the loss of ash is really, really significant here. Um, and within this photo, I'm delivering an event for the Exmouth Tree Project, and I'm showing the participants this fantastic ash, which hadn't actually been affected by ash dieback. But this is the species here, a lovely leafy species with a, a grey green uh, lichen body and these big old fruiting bodies across the surface of the lichen. So I hope that sets the scene a little bit of the importance of ash in relation to lichens. The next part of the presentation is going to be a brief introduction into how we go about identifying lichens before we focus on the identification of the project's target species, which will be the third part of my talk. So lichens come in all different shapes and sizes, as uh, demonstrated by my screen. And when we go about identifying them, we are looking for the presence and absence of certain features to try and put a name to the species that we have in front of us. When we talk about the main body of the lichen, we call this the lichen phallus. And this is how I am going to be referring to this for the rest of the pre presentation. So the lichen body is the lichen phallus. To help us identify lichens, we split the phallus growth forms into three main types. And this includes the crustose lichens, the foliose lichens, and the fruticose lichens as well. So with the crustose lichens, it does exactly what it says on the tin. Uh, these are very much crust forming lichens that are plastered onto the substrate and tend to form these fantastic mosaics as demonstrated in the photo. And to, to physically remove a, crust, a crustose lichen from uh, whatever it is it's growing on, you would physically have to remove part of the bark or part of the rock that the lichen is growing on because that's so tightly attached. Moving on to our foliose lichens, these are the leafy lichens. In general, these have a, a really distinct upper and lower surface, and they do tend to grow uh, quite tightly to the substrate, but you are actually able to peel them from the margins of the lobes. So these can sometimes be confused with fruticose lichens, which is our third growth type. Uh, but fruticose lichens are really shrubby, they're very bushy, and they have this fantastic three-dimensional, almost extraterrestrial appearance to them. And these, these fruticose lichens tend to be very characteristic and best developed in clean air situations. I will say, of course, it isn't that simple. There are other growth forms, but these are the three main types that I'm going to be covering for the target species uh, a little bit later on in my talk. Another important ID feature is how these different growth forms actually attach themselves to the substrate. <clears throat> so with crustose lichens, they lack a lower cortex. Um, so they, they lack that lower layer. So the fungal filaments of the lichen actually grow down and into the substrate, which is why the cross forming lichens are so, so tightly attached to the bark or to the rock and why you need to physically remove that surface with the lichen if you want to take it away. 
Moving on to foliose lichens, um, the majority of species have these little root-like projections, which we call rhizines. These rhizines or root-like structures, they only serve the purpose of attachment. They don't serve the purpose of transporting water or nutrients around the lichen body. When rhizines are absent, uh, lichens attach by haptas, which are a, a series of small little breaks on the, on the lower cortex, on the lower layer, where fungal filaments grow down and into the substrate, allowing them to attach. Then finally, for our fruticose lichens, these have uh, a central point of attachment, which we call a holdfast. And this is like a, a reinforced anchor that attaches the lichen in situ. And if you remove the lichen and almost like tap your finger uh, on, on where you think the holdfast might be, where it was uh, attaching itself to the substrate, you can actually really feel that the hardened part of the holdfast itself. Other ID features that we use are the reproductive features of lichens, and these are split into sexual and asexual features. For sexual reproduction in lichens, this involves the production of fruiting bodies, which we call apothecia. I will point out there are other types of fruiting bodies, but I'm not going to go into this today. Um, but these apothecia, these fruiting bodies, as shown on my screen, they come in all different shapes and all different sizes. And these fruiting bodies house the spores. And the spores are those little reproductive units produced by the fungi that contain the genetic material, which allows them to, to reproduce, colonize and disperse. The other type of reproduction that we have in lichens is asexual reproduction. And this is also known as vegetative reproduction. This comes in the form of ceridia, which is the photograph on the left of the screen. And this is a powder-like structure. Uh, they can also come in the form of isidia, which are the little finger-like structures to the right-hand side of the screen. And these propagules are basically pre-made packets of lichens that disperse into their surrounding environment. So it's a very efficient way of reproducing. There are, of course, a variety of other features that we use for identification, but uh, I would be here for a lifetime if I was to describe them all to you. So as my time is li limited, uh, I'm not gonna go through those and I'm just sticking to the, the ones that, the ID features that we've just gone through. So the final part, the final section of my talk is going to cover the 12 target lichen species, which have been chosen by the Devon Treescapes project. And this covers a variety of common and rare lichens that are found occupying ash trees. So um, yeah, do hold on to your seats because we've got 12 species to go through. And we're going to make a start with the cross-dose lichens. And our first species is Thelotrema lepidinum, which is also known as the barnacle lichen, very suitably named because it really does resemble a barnacle. Thelotrema is considered as one of the ancient woodland indicators. And as you can see in the photo, it forms this white crust on the bark. And these, this white crust is absolutely pickled in these really cool fruiting bodies. The apothecia here, they have, they have two margins to the fruits. So you have this white phaline exopel on the outside. And then on the inside, you have this true exopel, which is real papery in appearance. And if you can see the mouse on the screen, those fruits in the center uh, demonstrate that really, really well. Our next species is Arthonia cinnabarina, which is another one of these oldish woodland indicator species. Again, this lichen has apothecia, it has fruiting bodies across the phallus, but this one's quite special because the fruits are covered um, in, this, uh, in this orange pruina. So pruina is basically just calcium oxalate crystals and it, the, the pruina has this fantastic chemical reaction with potassium hydroxide. So this is one of the chemicals that we, we take out in our little dropper bottles. And it's the chemical that you find in drain on blocker. So we just put those crystals in 10% solution. And when you put potassium hydroxide on the pruina, it has a real striking K plus purple reaction. 
And the common name, uh, the common name for the species, the bloody comma lichen is, is very well suited, I think. The third species, uh, the third target species is Graphis scripta, which is one of the, the script lichens. And this is a species that occupies smooth bark situations. So it's normally found on younger ash stems or younger ash trunks, but then you also find it on other tree species like hazel, for example, <clears throat> or on the twigs where uh, the bark's really smooth. This one has a white phallus and it has these long and very stretched out apothecia that resemble writing or hieroglyphics, hence where it gets its, its common name from, the script lichen. Right, that was our final crustose lichen. We are moving on to the foliose lichens now, so the leafy lichens. Parmelia sulcata is another one of the target species, a very, very common lichen that we get on well-lit twigs and well-lit branches across the UK. It has a, a grey green phallus to it with a, a distinct network of white cracking, which we call pseudocyphelae. <clears throat> and from this white cracking, you get these outbursts of ceridia, so the powder, the, vege uh, the vegetative powder. It, uh, do be careful because there is another species that looks superficially similar. Uh, this one's called Parmelia saxatilis. Uh, it does look exactly the same, but it has ascidia breaking out of the white lines instead of ceridia. So fingers instead of powder. The next few foliose lichens on my slides belong to the Liberian community. And uh, this is a community that is really characteristic of base rich bark in clean air places in old growth woodland situations. So it's pretty choosy as to where it likes to live. And it's actually as rare as the habitat in which it occupies. So Liberia pulmonaria, which is also known as the lungwort lichen, it's uh, definitely one of the most treasured lichens in the UK, I think. Uh, it has a huge fan base. It's a really big, robust, leafy lichen, and it has this network of ridges, and those ridges provide structural support for the lichen. And looking at the photograph, you can really see why this structural support is needed, because the lobes really do come off of the tree. It's, it's quite remarkable, actually. This species, um, alongside other Liberia species, is really sensitive to air pollution and it requires quite high light levels in order to thrive and survive. And this species has seen monumental declines across Devon, unfortunately, and this is because of air pollution changing over time, but also inappropriate habitat management. You can actually see that at this site here on this photograph, uh, this site near Holm Woodlands, where you've got high levels of epiphytic ivy. So when I say epiphytic, I mean ivy that is growing on, on the, the tree itself. <clears throat> uh, Stictors are another one of the target species within the Liberian community. Um, I will point out that with Stictors, as part of the project, you don't need to record them to the species level, you just need to record them to the genus level. And the main, yeah, they are, they can be quite tricky stictors, so just to the genus, but the main ID feature for stictors is the smell. Because when stictors are wet, <laughs> they absolutely stink and they produce this really pungent smell of fish. It's, or oh, it's fish or gone off mushrooms, it's quite gross actually. Sometimes when stictors are really abundant in the woodland, you walk in and you can actually smell them before you see them. The other feature that uh, alongside the smell that characterizes uh, stictors are the cyphelae. Uh, there's a picture of cyphelae in the center of the screen. And these are basically breathing pores on the underside of the phallus, which allows gaseous, gaseous exchange uh, across the lichen, even when it is completely saturated because quite similar to plants, lichens can become waterlogged. So this allows them to occupy really wet conditions and still be able to breathe. You do, yeah, stictors, they, they, they like those, those wet, damp and shaded situations. Um, you mainly find them on trees like ash and on willow. <clears throat> The final foliose liberian lichens are the jelly lichens. Um, here, 
the fungi forms an association with cyanobacteria, so photosynthetic bacteria, instead of a green algae like all of the other, well, the majority of the other lichens that I've shown you. And here, the cyanobacteria is the dominant partner in this um, symbiotic relationship, whereas normally it's the other way around. So the jelly lichens, the calemmas, they're dark in colour <clears throat> and they really swell and look like jelly when they're wet because they lack this cellular cortex, which actually would be there to constrict them. But because that's not there, when they get wet, they swell and just uh, form this gelatinous mass on the trunks. <clears throat> Again, uh, just to point out, these jellies, for the purpose of the project, they don't need to be recorded to species level. They only need to be recorded to the genus level. Still in the foliose growth form, so we're still looking at our foliose lichens, but we're switching uh, lichen communities here. So we've gone from the clean air situations to more nutrient enriched situations, so more polluted situations. Here we have one of the most common lichens in the UK. And I'm delighted that common lichens are also getting recorded as part of this project because people just tend to record the rare stuff. So this is the sunburst lichen, um, also known as Xanthoria parietina. And this lichen has a real striking yellow to orange color as a result of the chemical pigment, which is called pariotin. And this pariotin acts as a, a chemical sunscreen to protect lichen, the lichen from the sunshine. And this species is also absolutely peppered in fruiting bodies, uh, these apothecia, which you can see on my screen. Um, and I, I will point out, uh, this can be a, a little bugger sometimes, it can be a little bit confusing um, because in shaded situations, this lichen can appear gray. And the reason it's gray is because of the, um, the, the reason it's grey is because the production of the chemical is actually really energetically expensive. Um, so if the sunscreen isn't re required because it's in the shade, then the species won't produce the chemical, um, hence the grey colour. But even if the lichen is grey, the discs of the fruiting bodies are always orange because the lichen wants to make sure that those spores stay protected. A much rarer and declining member of this, this community, it fits in this community, but also another one as well. Um, this is Anaptychia ciliaris, which is also known as the eagle's claw. This species gets its common name from those cilia, so these eyelash structures, which you can see in the photograph. And this gives the appearance of an eagle's claw, apparently. Um, <laughs> some people it might, I don't quite see it. Um, I will note that this photograph showcases a really uh, exceptional example of this species and uh, you don't normally find it fertile and normally when you come across it you only find little scraps of it. So um, it's not the easiest species to identify but I just wanted to show you how, how beautiful it is. Right, we're getting there. Final three species. Uh, we're in Fruticose territory now. This is Avernia prunastri, which is also known as the oak moss, even though it's called oak moss, which I don't quite know why. This is absolutely a lichen. For this purpose um, and for identification, uh, Avernia prunastri can actually fit into both folios and fruticose. And the reason for this is that when you look at it, it's very shrubby, uh, flattened and three dimensional in its appearance but it does actually have a distinct upper and lower surface, which makes it foliose. So the upper surface is green, which is where the algal layer, algal layer is arranged. And then the lower surface is actually white. <clears throat> and this species you, you tend to find in cleaner air situations. Ramalina farinacea, um, the strap lichens, <clears throat> uh, superficially similar. But instead of it having a green upper layer and a white lower layer, it is just green around the entirety of the lichen, which makes it one of these true fruticose species. 
Our final target species uh, for the project is Osnia articulata, such a, it's a kraken little lichen, and it's very aptly named the string of sausages lichen. This lichen has a, a large inflated phallus that is constricted, and where these constrictions occur, uh, the central cord of the lichen is revealed, and it, it does definitely give the appearance of a string of sausages. And this species is found on a variety of different trees, but has a very strong uh, distribution within the southwest of England. So it's one of the specialities, I think, that we have down here. Hurrah! <laughs> We've made it through the 12. That's brilliant. Um, so that was a whistle stop tour of the, the 12 target lichen species that the Devon Treescapes project is actively trying to encourage you guys to record. And this concludes the, the final section of my presentation. But before I finish, I just want to make uh, people aware of the Devon Lichen Group. And this group was initially set up by Barbara Benfield back in the 90s, I think. And it's uh, after a short hiatus, I've decided to attempt to reignite the group. I've been pretty useless recently with organizing field meetings uh, because I've just been so busy. But if anyone is interested or anyone wants more information, including contact details, then uh, please do head to the British Lichen Society website um, where we do have a web page. And we, we do welcome anyone at any level with an interest in lichens and for those that just really want to learn more about the county's flora. So I thought that might be worth a mention. So I think that's me finished. <laughs> uh, managed to stick to time just about. Hope everyone found that useful and the talk provided an interesting introduction to lichens, especially in relation to ash within Devon. Thanks to everyone that joined this evening. Uh, like I said, I'm absolutely delighted that over 100 people have attended this talk. And a big old thank you to uh, the Devon Treescapes Project and Devon Wildlife Trust for organising events like this. And also for all of the brilliant work that they're doing across the county uh, through this project. So, Lindsay, I will hand back over to yourself. <laughs> thank you very much, April. That was a fascinating presentation with lots of amazing photographs. So I have got a question about photography for you, but I will hold that for now. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen again, because there's a few more slides I'd just like to share with people about what happens next. So, um, oops, sorry, just gone too far. So how to record lichens. So if you are interested in getting involved in some of our citizen science recording with us, then we have a web-based app, the um, address of which is there at the top of that screen, www.devontreescapes.com. And we're using that within our project to record various of the species that we are monitoring, including the lichens. These are just a couple of screenshots of what you can expect when you go on there to record a lichen. There's some very basic details that I help are self-explanatory. One to say who you are so that we can come back to you with any questions if we've got any. But then there's some drop down boxes, obviously the date, the type of habitat and the type of tree or other substrate that you may have found the lichen on, as well as your um, identification of one of those 12 species. There's a little bit more as well. Obviously, we'd like to know what type of tree it's on and what part of the tree the lichen is on and a rough idea of its size as well. And there's a space to add any notes if you want to tell us anything else that's notable about that particular lichen or that particular featured habitat and a space to upload a photo as well. Photos are really important because we will be verifying the identification. So don't worry too much. And as April says, on many of those 12 species, we're actually not asking you to identify down to the species level. So as far as you can go in the different levels of, of identification and classification, we will accept your record. So don't be afraid. Don't let the fact that you might not be able to identify it down to species level put you off from submitting some data for us. We will welcome your data regardless. 
So if you feel confident enough after this presentation to start recording, you are ready to go. You know where the app, where to find the app now. We will be making a handout available to you with those 12 species on it. And this recording will be made available on our YouTube channel from tomorrow. So you can always go back and have another look, recap what April has said before you go out and have a look. And I suggest, you know, you can build it into your normal um, activities. So if you're going out for a walk or to the park, just ha start having a look at some trees and start having a look to see what you can identify there in terms of the lichens. If you'd like a bit more support and a bit more in-person training, then April is very kindly running four sessions for us in different parts of the county between now and March. The first of those is available to book now on Eventbrite. Um, and you can also get to that link to Eventbrite through our Devon Wildlife Trust events page on the website. And that is in Exmouth on the 6th of December. Those other dates up there for January, February, March aren't live for booking just yet, but will be quite soon. We usually advertise a month to six weeks before the event happens itself. They're free to attend. We'd love to see you there, particularly if you're new, brand new to recording, because I know it can sometimes feel a little bit complicated and you'd like a bit more um, help and some, to boost your confidence before you go and record for, for real. So please do come and join us on one of those events if you can. And as April mentioned, there is also the opportunity to get involved with the Devon Lycan group. Again, any level any, from beginner to ex expert is welcome in the group. And there is a Facebook page as well if you'd like to join that. That can be useful, I think, for, for sort of mutual support as well and for checking your identifications maybe uh, before you record things if you'd like some extra help with that. So opportunities there to continue to develop your skills um, and to help us record uh, lichens across the county. So it's time for questions now. And whilst we take those, I'm going to leave those links up there, some of the ones that we've mentioned between us today and my contact details at the bottom. If you do want to get in touch, then please use that email address. So April, there's a few questions that have been coming in and there may have been more as I've been rabbiting away. So I'm just going to find those. Yeah, I just want to really reiterate what Lindsay has said. So with these introductory sessions that the, the Wildlife Trust have put on, uh, please, please, whatever level you are at, uh, you are absolutely welcome to come. And these will be really focused around that beginner level and early intermediate as well. So I know it can be a little bit off putting sometimes taking on a new group, but um, we'll work through it together and make sure everyone, you know, uh, gets brought up to the to the same level so it's not overwhelming. So April there are some uh, requests for recommendations for field guides actually or good books that might help. Yeah so <clears throat> as a beginner um, I think the field studies council fold out guides are absolutely brilliant. Uh, they do an offer on a pack where I think they have six different field guides, which covers different habitats. I think there's like coastal, urban, churchyards, lichens on twigs. And I think it's about 18 pounds. So I think that they're a really good starting point and you can do a little bit of picture matching. Uh, the other uh, going from fold out guides to um, identification books, uh, the, the only ID book that we really have for lichens is the Frank Dobson guide. I think it's an illustrated guide to lichens. I think the last one was brought out in 2018. So uh, it's about £35, that one. And Frank Dobson also did uh, these spiral bound ID guides to these, these spiral bound books. And he did those um, habitat specific as well. So he did one for coasts, one for trees and one for churchyards. And they're £15 each. Um, so for the beginner, early intermediate level, they're the, that is the literature and the guides that I would recommend. OK, brilliant. There's a couple of questions about the relationship between lichens and the tree. So are they parasites or do they benefit mm. the tree in any way? Yeah, so lichens have no dependency on what they're growing on apart from attachment. So. Lichens don't uptake water, they don't uptake any nutrients from the tree. 
they only need the tree there so they can attach themselves. Um, everything that they need for survival, they absorb from their surrounding environment. And that is why they're such good environmental indicators, because if the surrounding environment is of poor quality, the lichens are also of poor quality as well. Well, here's an interesting question. What do you think is the possibility of discovering a lichen that hasn't yet been discovered? Oh, it happens all the time. <laughs> you could probably uh, find a new species in your garden, actually. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, so within the last flora that we had, the big Bible that we used to identify, identify lichens, there were 1,800 species of lichens identified within the UK, found to occupy the British Isles. And in less than a decade, it's now over 2,000. Wow. So, yes, uh, if, if people dedicated their, their time to studying lichens, it's very, very uh, easy to uh, find new species. There we go. A good field for experts to become involved in then. Um, what uses can lichens have to humans? Can we eat them? Or are there any medicinal uses? Yeah, so I just want to say to make sure my back and the Devon Wildlife Trust back is covered. I do not advocate uh, eating lichens in any way, shape or form. But uh, looking at the social use of lichens, uh, most people have heard of lichens in some capacity through the doctrine of signatures. And <clears throat> this is where people used to actually uh, ingest um sort of uh, lichens, fungi or plants that resembled parts of the body and they were used to treat minor ailments. Uh, so with the lungwort lichen, for example, the one that you've seen uh, sort of recurring throughout my presentation, uh, is called Liberia pulmonaria. And they uh, people thought that this really resembled lung tissue. So this was actually boiled up and uh, ingested to, to treat respiratory problems. Some lichens are edible. Uh, the most uh, famous one, I think, for a lot of people is the rock tripe, um, which is called Lysalia postulata. And it has been documented that that species has been eaten by mountaineers in times of food shortage. And in other places around the world, um, that family, so Lysalia postulata, belongs to the family Umbilicariaceae um, in Southeast Asia. That, you know, these these umbilicaria species are harvested on quite a large scale as a as a delicacy. Lichens are used to, to spice up foods as well. So, uh, yes, lichens can be eaten. However, there are some some poisonous lichens and uh, we do have uh, a really poisonous one within the British Isles, which is called vulpa cedar. So vulpa cedar, the vulp bit coming from vulpus vulpus, which is the Latin name for fox. And the chemical used to be extracted from vulpa cedar and put on the tips of arrows to, to shoot foxes in other, in other parts of the world. So, so yes, I don't advocate eating lichens. And you could probably get more information from people who regularly and actively forage, uh, but I don't know enough about it. <laughs> Well, that was a very good answer. It's oh, okay. very interesting. <laughs> um, there's a couple of questions about reproduction as well. So when spores are produced, are they exclusively fungal or do they take some of their favourite algae with them? How does that work? Yeah, <clears throat> so the, the spores that are produced are exclusively fungal. Uh, so when you're looking at the two reproduction types, when the spores are released into the environment, what they have to do is they have to find a suitable surface and germinate and then incorporate a suitable algal partner um, before a lichen forms. So it's a very slow approach to reproduction, but it is important for genetic diversity. But with asexual reproduction, so vegetative reproduction, you have like a pre-made package of lichen in either the ceridia, which is the powder, or the fingers, which is the acidia. And that pre-made package can then be dispersed by animals, by water, by wind. Uh, but obviously it is essentially a clone of its, of its parents, so it doesn't have that, that genetic diversity. And how far can lichen spores travel? Overseas, there, there's been really interesting studies looking at the bottom of birds' feet, of migrating birds' feet, and yet lichens can cross overseas. 
That's amazing. So I was going to ask you, April, what are your top tips for photographing lichens? Because you obviously need to get quite close. But... Yeah. So what I will say is lichens are excellent subjects to photograph. Uh, firstly, they are stunning. They are absolutely beautiful. Um, but also they're really easy because they don't move. <laughs> they don't move and they're there all year round. Uh, so, I mean, a very small proportion of lichens are seasonal, but about I think it's about 98 percent of lichens are there in that state all year round. So they're, they're really good to photograph. Uh, the photographs that you've seen in my presentation, so the, the more habitat scale shots and the shots of the larger species are just taken through my really old iPhone. But the close up, uh, the close up photographs, they are taken with the most amazing camera, which is and you do not need to be a photographer to use this camera. It's super easy to use. I'm not a photographer and I can use it. And it's called an Olympus TG6. And what it is, is basically a portable photo stacker. So you hold your camera there and it will take uh, up to 10 photographs at different distances. And then it compiles all the photographs together in one shot and it makes sure that the whole the whole thing is in focus and nothing's blurred. Um, I think in terms of price, so I, I've got the TG6, but it obviously goes down 543. Um, so the older the version, the cheaper it is. But my TG6 was about £350. And yeah, for layman photographers like myself, it's really, really easy to use. That's great. Interesting. I've got the TG5, which I bought a few years ago for a similar mm. price. So yeah, I didn't know there was a new one on the market. Yeah, I will say sorry as well, Lindsay, that um, you can they are completely waterproof. So you can also photograph um, aquatic lichens with them as well. And uh, the difference between the TG6 and the TG5 is that the, um, the, the TG5 was really good for underwater shots in seawater, in salt water. And this new TG6 one is really good uh, for uh, fresh water. Great. Thank you. Welcome. Can lichens continue to grow if the tree dies or if the branch falls off? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. So as long, so obviously if a tree was to fall um, over time, the, the bark chemistry and the bark properties do start to change. Um, and as the, as the tree starts to rot, you get a suite of fun, uh, different fungi that will come in and parasitize the deadwood. And it also makes lichens much more prone to being grazed by snails. But yeah, in the past, I've been involved in various lichen translocation projects. So where you transplant lichens from a fallen tree onto a standing tree. <clears throat> and, you know, uh, we've done translocations about a year after the tree has fallen. So, yes, they can still survive, but there is a, a cutoff period where the fungi and the the snails start to take over the lichen. That's amazing. Um, and I think we might end with this question, although I will do a quick scan just to check whether there's anything else. April, what is your favourite lichen? And why? Oh, my favourite <laughs> lichen. So if I had some of my trainees watching this, they would laugh because um, I say that everything's my favourite lichen and everything's my favourite place. But uh, my, uh, the, I feel the pinnacle and the absolute most favourite lichen is uh, it's called rock tripe, which is Lasalia postulata. I was talking about it earlier. And it's a species that occupies mainly upland situations on acid rock. So where I am near Dartmoor is like a HQ for this species. And it tends to like the rain tracks down the rock. But in terms of why it's my favourite, I think it was on my hit list for so long and I just randomly came across it and it it just it was how it made me feel I think as to why it's my favorite because I mean you look at it and it's 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 not the the, the prettiest lichen uh Lasalia postulata it is covered in these pustules but yeah it's how it made me feel and the excitement that I had so I would say that is probably my my favorite lichen <laughs> That's great. And I have to say your enthusiasm is infectious. It shines. Oh, through. Thank you. <laughs> I am going to ask just one more question because there's some good ones here about um, the ash habitat. And so yeah. you, 
if the if the lichens don't take anything from the tree, why do they like specific types? What is it about the ash that makes it a preferred habitat or, an, or for an obligate lichen, for example? So I always really, it's a very, very good question, but I always really dislike it because I just don't have the answer for it. And um, I actually asked uh, an amazing lichenologist the same question, Ray Woods. It was on a discussion panel that we had. He's been looking at lichens for decades and he also has no idea. So why lichens, why, why some species of lichens have certain preferences for certain trees I cannot answer that question, unfortunately. So I am sorry about that, whoever asked that question, but it is a very good one. And I would love to know the answer myself. There's an area of research still to be tackled then. Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you very much, April. And thank you everybody for your participation this evening and for your questions. Um, citizen science is essential to us to be able to monitor what is going on out there. We, we can't do it with the small number of staff and scientists that, that exist studying these things without the greater help that, that citizen scientists provide. So I hope we've given you some ideas for how you can get more involved. Um, please do have a look for the recording of this talk tomorrow or from tomorrow on our YouTube channel. Um, and you can find out more about events on the Devon Wildlife Trust website events page. Thank you very much for your time this evening and hope to see you again in the future. Good evening.